Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be with you here today. We are continuing our lecture series on the church and the councils and the Alexandrian heroes. Today we're going to talk about the year 451 AD, which was the year in which the schism took place. Up to this point, we had three councils and one church. There were no divisions. But unfortunately, this year came and there, were, there was a great schism in the church. What happened and how did the church split? It's important for us to know what happened and how, how did this schism take place and what events took place before it and what happened afterwards and what should be our position. Um, this book is from uh, Abuna Shenouda Meher and if anyone wants to dive further into this topic uh, this is where to start. Uh, this will tell you exactly how to look at the Council of Chalcedon in which the schism took place and uh, basically gives you the right lens through which we should look at the topic. And we actually have the entire minutes of the Council of Chalcedon in three volumes available too. But again, the first book, if you want to look into this further, is the book Christology and the Council of Chalcedon by Abunishim of the Man. I'd like to start off by saying that before we go into any history, especially controversial topics, it's important for us to, to pray and read so the Lord will uh, guide us in understanding in the way that we should through obeying our beloved mother the church and we bow our heads to her teachings for us as we go into this topic uh, one verse that uh, sticks out for me is a verse from the book of proverbs do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set and we'll find here that there is some behavior that took place that was uh, opposite to this command. And finally, when we look at history, uh, especially events such as this, we wanted to reflect on we want to reflect mm -hmm. on ourselves, and not just have a history lesson, but have some sort of application. And we remember that when we look into such events, uh, we are dealing with real people. Uh, and these real people had communications and relationships. And so we reflect on our personal relationships and the way we communicate with our loved ones, our colleagues, our classmates. And we look into what can we learn? What can we learn from the mistakes of others? What can we learn from the, the positive things that we read? So I'd like to keep that in mind as we are going through uh, these events. First of all, uh, at the end of the Council of Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, there was some controversy during the Council and afterwards. During the Council, the Church of Antioch was late, and Pope Kyrgios, uh, the pillar of faith, began the Council before they arrived. And the Church of Antioch held the Council, and Pope Kyrgios held the Council, and when news got to the emperor's ears about this, he put 
he put both patriarchs under arrest uh, until things were settled. Uh, this led to a break in the communion between the Church of Alexandria and the Church of Antioch. And uh, thank God, uh, after a couple years, uh, they reconciled with great pressure uh, from the government on Pope Kurulus, uh as well as the Patriarch of Antioch, and they came up with this formula of reunion of the year 433 A.D. Uh, the way that the, count, the, the letter was written left a, a little bit ambiguous with regards to the nature of Christ. It says there has occurred a union of two natures without making it specific whether it's one nature or two natures afterwards. Uh, we all know that we believe in one nature out of uh, one incarnate nature, one nature out of two. And the school of Antioch uh, believed in two natures led by uh, uh, or who who uh, distributed the teaching and made it famous was Nestorius and um, Saint Cyril took a letter from the Patriarch of Antioch uh, to start the reconciliation and he marked it up he made he put the words out of out of which the nature out of which, or out of two, and we'll talk about that a little bit, in a little bit. Uh, and so after this formula, formula of reunion, there became different interpretations, okay? Um, we have to look at the way St. Cyril interpreted that letter in the, in the correct, pure way uh, in his subsequent letters. Unfortunately, some Others from the Church of Antioch continued to look at it in, in a sort of two-nature way, and that, that would eventually lead to more problems down the road that led to the schism. Some important Christo Christological doctrines we need to touch on before we go into the historical events. We'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, we talk about the fraction of the Feast of the Cross. In that fraction, we say one is Emmanuel who is indivisible after the union, undivided in two natures. The Son died on the cross, and we reference St. Peter in his first epistle, Christ suffered for us in the flesh. When we talk about Christ's nature, we all, always say out of two, one nature out of two, or from two. We never say two. Whenever we say one, we have to use the word incarnate or enfleshed. The enfleshed, or the one enfleshed nature or incarnate nature of the divine Logos. That means God the Word came and took flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary. And uh, when out, out of that, we have one person, one hypostasis, one nature, one incarnate nature. Once the union has taken place, there, they are no longer two. It is one incarnate nature of the Divine Logos. And St. Cyril's famous uh, metaphor is iron and fire, how the iron receives the fire into itself. What if you take a hammer and beat the iron, the iron is what takes the beating, but the fire is in it, and it's united in it. So how do we speak of Christ, one nature out of two, and how do we understand it in our minds? Uh, as we said before, it's one incarnate nature, it's, it's one composite nature, because it is made up of the divinity and the humanity. One incarnate nature, one composite nature. It's not a simple one, it's a one out of two. And that's why we are called Miaphysites, because 
the famous formula of Saint Cyril, Mia Physis. Mia Physis. Mia means one out of two. Mia Physis to Theologos Exarchomeni, which is one incarnate nature of the divine Logos. And Saint Cyril explains it by saying the human being, as an example, is a composition out of two natures, soul and body. We don't say that we have two men, but we have a single man out of two. We only make the distinction in contemplation between the two natures, in our mental intuitions. Saint Severus says, after the thought of union, it is not correct to affirm two natures. They, Saint Cyril and Saint Severus, do not divide the sayings of the Lord between two natures and they say, okay, in this case it's God speaking or the divine nature speaking and here the human nature speak speaking as if they, they were separate and existed separately. That's not how we read the expressions of the Lord in the Holy Bible. After the union, there is no longer two, they are, they are one. After the union, excuse me, it is one out of two. So some of the events leading up to Chalcedon, for those just joining us, I'd just like to remind you, we are talking about the schism that took place in the year 451 AD. And before we get to the Council of Chalcedon, there are some events related to it that we have to discuss. First, the Eutychian controversy. Eutychius, Eutychius was an archimandrite, an abbot. Uh, he had a lack of eloquence and, as we'll see a little bit, an apparent lack of understanding. He uh, opposed the Nestorian heresy, but he took it to the other extreme. He took it to the other extreme and taught one nature, but not in the way that Saint Cyril taught. He also had some political influences and uh, he was able to uh, spread his teaching and his teaching caught the attention of several people. One of them is this person here, Eusebius of Dorylium, we'll call him E.D. for now, uh, who ended up accusing Eutyches. And a council was held, or a synod in Constantinople, to discuss Eutyches' heresy and E.D.'s accusation against him. Flavian of Constantinople was the bishop and uh, he was uh, uh, presiding over this council which ended up deposing Eutyches and Eutyches ended up appealing to several people, to Pope Leo of Rome, to Pope Dioscorus of Alexandria. He appealed also to the emperor and uh, Flavian sends the minutes of the meeting to Pope Leo, and in response, Pope Leo sent his famous tome, which we'll, we'll discuss later on. And then after that, there was an investigation because Eutyches appealed, and he said there was a forgery of, of the meeting minutes, uh, and we shall see what happened. Uh, eventually, a, a new council, was called by Emperor Theodosius II and he asked Pope Dioscorus of Alexandria to preside over it to eliminate Nestorianism once and for all. And uh, if I may back up and point out that uh, these two, ED and FC, were uh, uh, directing Eutyches that he had to uh, confess two natures of Christ. And, of course, 
for you to hear. He hears two natures. He thinks the story is, and and the story and heresy, and so he completely opposed it. But as we said, it was a uh, uh, off balance uh, belief in the one nature that that he that he believed in, and and so. Uh, Pope Dioscorus heard about this, and of course, we don't say two natures, and as we shall see later, two natures does imply the Nestorian heresy. And so he also, Pope Dioscorus that is, asked Pope uh, Emperor Theodosius to call for uh, a new council. And they reopened the case of Eutyches, and they reread the minutes of the Synod at Constantinople and the later investigation. In that council, which is known as Ephesus II, the council confirmed the faith of Nicaea and the first council of Ephesus by Pope Cyril. The council of Ephesus II did not bring about any new teaching, any new definition of faith, all they did was they took the faith of Nicaea and confirmed by uh, the Council of Ephesus I and they used that basically as their criterion. And they emphasized something called Canon 7. Canon 7 was put by Ephesus I and said no one is allowed to bring forth any new definition of faith whatsoever. Okay? So based on that criterion and the statement of faith that uh, Eutyches presented to the council, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, he was exonerated and uh, ED and FC were, were excommunicated and other people who were um, accused of being Nestorian were also excommunicated. And Pope Dioscorus ended up overseeing uh, new bishops for both the, both the cities of Constantinople and Antioch. So we have to ask ourselves, to what extent was Eutyches a Eutychian heretic? Okay. Uh, some scholars say that he seems to have been a confused and unskillful thinker, okay? Uh, he exaggerated his suspicion uh, of, the, of the Lord being of one essence with us as humans. And so his idea of uh, the human nature of Christ was either... Uh, mere appearance or people uh, took that to uh, infer from from his statement that uh, him, he rejected uh, the Lord being of one essence with us as humans even though he said he is of one essence with Saint Mary his mother which if you think about it doesn't make sense if the Lord is of one essence with Saint Mary, of course, he would be of one essence with us, with the rest of humanity, because Saint Mary was a human being like anybody else. So he was a little bit confused. Uh, he was he was not eloquent, as we stated before. Uh, this scholar says he was devoted to Cyril's formula one nature, although he omitted to add his saving qualification, made flesh. So if you remember, we said whenever. He, we talk about the nature of Christ, we say the one incarnate nature or the one enfleshed nature. We do not say one nature on its own. And it's that which differentiated what Eutyches taught and what St. Cyril taught. So how is it justified? that the Second Council of Ephesus, presided by Pope Dioscorus, exonerated Eutyches. Well, Pope Dioscorus received them into communion because it had seemed to him, uh, it had seemed to him that 
He presented an orthodox confession of faith and that Eutyches uh, repented of his error. But later on, uh, as we will see in the Council of Chalcedon, Pope Dioscorus actually uh, separated himself and he said, you know what, all I care about is the faith, is the orthodox faith. I don't care about any person, including Eutyches. And he anathematized him. Uh, one scholar says that between the home synod and uh, uh, he points out some contradictions between what Eutyches said at the home synod, the later investigation, and at Ephesus too. And he says that it seems behind such contradictions are either a forgery or an unbalanced personality. Okay. Uh, and then to bring this to a summary, uh, we see one scholar says, actually an Eastern Orthodox scholar, he says Pope Dioscorus could never be accused of being a monophysite, which is the the single or the simple one nature belief in Christ. We are neophysites, one nature out of two, one incarnate nature out of two. He could never be accused along with Eutyches. Neither Dioscorus himself nor any other of the Oriental Orthodox Fathers ever followed Eutyches. Again, just to remind everybody, we're talking about the schism that took place in 451 AD. So we have to talk about and, and uh, look at the political factors which precipitated that schism. First, this idea of papal supremacy of the, the, the Pope of Rome and how he uh, claims that because St. Peter, they look at St. Peter as the mediator between Christ and the Apostles, somehow this role is mystically uh, passed down to the rest of the Popes of Rome. Uh, we don't look at it this way. We say St. Peter was an elder among equals. He is not a mediator, in other words, above the rest of the Apostles, the mediator between Christ and the Apostles? No. The Orthodox, the upright understanding is that St. Peter was an elder among equals. Now this thinking began with uh, Pope Leo's two predecessors and he was the first one to, to actually take uh, a lot of action as we shall see. Uh, early on when Pope Dioscorus took the throne Pope Leo sent him a letter and says, uh, you know what, St. Mark uh, wouldn't have established the rites apart from uh, St. Peter, and so when you have a feast in the church and you celebrate the liturgy and the people leave, and then you have enough people that come back, you can still celebrate the liturgy on the same altar, uh, as long as you have enough people. Uh, of course, Pope Dioscorus uh, did not act on that because, uh, as most of you are well aware, our rites dictate that the altar, the altar vessels, all have to fast. We do not perform a liturgy immediately one after the other uh, on the same altar and on this, you know, using the same altar vessels. The Roman representatives at Chalcedon, because Pope Leo, as was the custom of the popes, popes did not condescend to attend the councils in person. They referred to him as the head of the universal church. So these are, again, claims uh, to be uh, the bishop of the, the whole church. Okay. Now, an additional pressure from the government as well as from Leo. Uh, it appears that the outcomes of the council, especially when you read through the minutes, were already predetermined. And there was no scope 
for contrary voices. And a lot of that was because the people in charge of the council uh, were the government, the representatives of the emperor. Uh, this is contrary to past councils in which uh, decisions were made by consensus. Uh, so this is one thing to keep in mind. Uh, one scholar says, when, he, when we think about the pressure from Leo and his representatives, that in the Council of Chalcedon there was no true discussion. There was no real dialogue. People who had uh, dissenting opinions. It was not brought to light further and further discussed. So you have a, a healthy dialogue and to come out with something that everybody is okay with, to have a consensus. None of that took place. Uh, in addition, Pope Dioscorus was, was admitted uh, as the accused. And and the Romans and Pope Leo expected and requested that the council accept his letter, his tome, without any discussion. So leading up to Chalcedon, uh, immediately after the second council of Ephesus and, and knowing its decisions, uh, the Church of Rome, led by Pope Leo, opposed it. He wrote a letter to the new Empress, Pulcheria, calling that council a council of robbers. Unfortunately, that name has stuck, uh, even to today, uh, that that council is referred to as a council of robbers. Uh, another event that took place was that Emperor Theodosius II uh, was riding on a horse and he fell and he died suddenly. And his sister, Polcheria, and her husband took the throne and they sided with the Church of Rome. And so they started to undo the works of Ephesus II. The emperor, even before in calling a new council, he took Eutyches, he degraded him, he put him under arrest. Pope Leo uh, excommunicated the leaders of Ephesus II again before a new council uh, had taken place, including Juvenal of Jerusalem, the Patriarch of Jerusalem. Uh, all the bishops that were deposed, that were accused of being Nestorians based on their teaching, based on the teaching of two natures. They were returned from exile, again, before a council was held. All of this was done in the background when the new emperor and empress were uh, uh, ascended to the throne. In addition to all of that, the tome of Leo was distributed across all the bishops of the East, and they were asked to sign. And that was seen as a condition to return into communion with the Church of Rome. And then finally, a new council is summoned. Uh, first, it was summoned at Nicaea, and then it moved to, to uh, Chalcedon. It's important to note here one thing, that this emperor Marcion wanted to see himself as a new Constantine because to, to remind everyone, the first council, ecumenical council, took place at Nicaea, and the first uh, version of the Orthodox Creed was produced at Chalcedon, and under, of course, the leadership uh, or while Emperor Constantine was uh, the head of the Roman Empire. And so this guy, Marcion, wanted to see himself as the new Constantine and his wife as the new Helen. And he wanted to have that image and have that uh, name for himself by placing the council at Nicaea and wanting a new definition, which is something we'll talk about in a moment. But then he moved it to Chalcedon 
And he moved it to Chalcedon because Chalcedon geographically is closer to Constantinople. And he wanted to make sure that the council was under his strict imperial control. And that shows us that the Council of Chalcedon was dictated and controlled by the government. It was not a council in which the bishops can act freely. Again, reminding everyone, we are talking about the schism of the year 451 that took place in the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, background to the council. The council was presided uh, by a committee of high government officials, so it was not presided by uh, a, a bishop, just like the Council of Ephesus I was presided by Pope Cyril the Great, Ephesus II presided by Pope Dioscorus. And when you examine who were the uh, government officials, you'll see that actually a lot of them had ties to this person here, Theodoret, Bishop of Cyrus, who was a stark Nestorian. He was a stark rival of St. Cyril while St. Cyril was alive. He, he attacked St. Cyril in his writings and he did not approve the excommunication of Nestorius. And the chairman, the chairman of the committee who did most of the talking and gave instructions to the bishops was actually a personal friend of TC, Theodoret of Cyrus here. It's only the third session in which Pope Dioscorus was condemned, so his trial. It was only that session, the third session, in which the government was not there. And they probably did that to escape direct responsibility of this trial and condemnation. About 370 bishops attended from across the empire. It took place in the church of St. Euphemia, the martyr, just outside of Chalcedon. And the council was held in six, uh, 16 sessions from uh, beginning of October to, to beginning of November 451 AD. Okay, now we get into the actual uh, sessions of the Council and what took place. The first session, uh, immediately, immediately, the Romans uh, did not like Pope Dioscorus even entering the Council as a bishop and they demanded that he take a seat as a defendant. So one, one thing to comment is, um, one, one thing to comment, Excuse me for that, we'll, we'll continue now. Uh, so again, the first session, he was taken, Pope Dioscorus was taken, uh, demanded as a defendant. And just to let you know, the on one side you had uh, the uh, uh, Pope of Rome and all of his supporters. On the other side, you had Pope Dioscorus and all of the leaders of Ephesus too, and in front of them were uh, the government officials, and in the center was a copy of the Holy Bible. And then when it was demanded that Pope Dioscorus had to take a seat as a, as a defendant, he had to go and sit in front, uh, front and center in front of everyone as the one who was accused. And he had to uh, listen to E.D. Uh, stand in front of everyone and impose charges on him that 
uh, uh, and, and not the faith was given a priority to discuss in the council in the beginning, but rather the charges against Pope Dioscorus. And, and then TC, who we said Theodoret of Cyrus, was admitted because Pope Leo had restored them again before the council. And some of the bishops cried out saying, turn out the teacher of Nestorius. But yet he was uh, allowed to be in. And then they proceeded to read the minutes from uh, Ephesus 2 and the Canon 7, as we talked about before. And unfortunately here we find that uh, the supporters of Pope Dioscorus, one by one, began to desert him and cross the aisle and sit on the, on the other side. And each had his own agenda. For example, the Bishop Juvenal of Jerusalem uh, had an agenda to make Jerusalem an official patriarchate and he's been wanting that for years and he let his own personal agenda compromise his integrity and compromise his faith. And that's one lesson for us to learn that when it comes to situations in our lives, we should never allow our own personal desires or uh, objectives compromise who we are as sons and daughters of the Lord and, and lose our eternity because of worldly ranks or worldly possessions. Um, Pope Dioscorus in his uh, profession uh, as they were reading the minutes, he said, I accept from two, not two, referring to natures, referring to the natures. I accept from two, but not two natures. And this shows us that sometimes there are situations in which we have to speak up. Even if we are not called to speak, there are times where we have to speak up and bear testimony to the truth. Finally, at the end of session one, Pope Dioscorus and the other leaders, even though they crossed the aisle, they were placed under arrest. Session two, Pope Leo's tome was read, and but before that, the uh, chairman, the government chairman, he gave an instruction that a draft definition of the faith should be produced. The bishop strongly objected, but the chairman ignored. And he said at the end of the session, what has been instructed will be enforced and will take place. And so he assigned a subcommittee that took, behind, took place behind closed doors. No minutes were recorded to produce that draft. Now regarding the Tome of Leo, some of the text is questioned because of its Nestorianizing tone, and some of it was questioned, meaning in the council itself by some of the bishops. And in a deceptive way, the response that was given was they took snippets from St. Cyril's writings and aligned them to uh, what Leo said in his tome, ignoring other parts of St. Cyril's writings was in direct opposition to what Leo taught in his tome. Okay, and then even with those attempts to align the writings of St. Cyril with Leo, there were still some bis bishops who were hesitant and so they called for a side meeting that took place uh, outside of the council. Again, no meeting, no meeting minutes, none of that was recorded, in which the Romans were to uh, alleviate uh, some of the concerns of those bishops. Now, what did the Tome of Leo actually say and mean? 
Oh, some of the things that he said, while the loneliness or humility of manhood and the loftiness of the Godhead meet together. And this meet together is not what St. Cyril said. St. Cyril used the word united or a hypostatic union or a natural union. Here, meet together really means by turns or alternating. Okay, and this understanding attributes different operations to the different natures. Now, what else? He said each of the two, each of the two natures or the two forms act, and the function, they act the function that is proper to it. And one scholar says this was his incriminating formula. Another said he did not weigh his words carefully. Now, what else is wrong with that statement? One scholar said, the fact remains that Leo's understanding of the operations of Christ differed from those of St. Cyril. For St. Cyril, the operations existed outside of Christ. That is, some of the effects were human and some divine, but for Leo, they exist in Christ. So to explain that a little bit, some of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ did uh, are clearly the, uh, the result of being divine, and some of them were the result of being human. For example, when Christ would sleep or eat, this is a result of being human, having human needs. Christ forming or creating eyeballs for the man born blind, this is clearly the result of being God. Some of them, some of, uh, some examples are God or our Lord Jesus Christ uh, having uh, two, the, being God and human. For example, uh, walking on water. Well, God, the divine nature does not walk but the human being cannot walk on water. So that example is an example of the two. The point is, is that for Saint Cyril, it is only the effects that we look at and we say, well, this is the result of being God. This is the result of being a human. But for Leo, those differences exist in Christ, within Christ, in whom each nature had its own striving towards that activity. And that's the, the biggest difference. St. Severus's criticism of the tome, he says, it's inconsistent and we're intelligible Nestorian. Uh, another uh, scholar says about St. Severus and other opponents, they say that were they not justified in cursing or, or anathematizing uh, the tome of Leo, in which in Christ there are two natures, each with its separate activity, and followed the Nestorian way of dividing the Lord. Another one says the tome of Leo is an artificiality, entirely alien to the Gospels, to the Gospel texts. Even Nestorius himself, while he was in exile in Upper Egypt, in Achmim, he, he praised the Tome of Leo and he said there are no essential differences between his theology and the Tome of Leo. And then finally, St. Cyril in the faith of Ephesus 1, he wrote 12 famous anathemas that he attached to the third letter that he wrote to Nestorius. He said that anyone distributes the expressions of the Lord to two, attributing some to a man and attributing others as befitting God, let him be an anathema. Now let's come back to the Council of Chalcedon, session three. In this session, Pope Dioscorus was put on trial and he was condemned. Uh, only a fraction of the bishops were there, 204, that means not many bishops wanted to be a part of it. It was already predetermined 
the senior Roman representative presided. There were no government uh, uh, officials attending. Again, E.D., Eusebius of Derillium, uh, presented his plaint against Pope Dioscorus. And then they called for him three times. Remember, he was put under arrest, along with the other bishops at Ephesus too. And so they were outside of the council, under guard, and they called for him three times uh, to attend the council. He requested that the government officials attend. He requested that the other leaders uh, from Ephesus to attend. He basically said, why am I being singled out? I was not the only one who led the council of Ephesus too. And I want the officials there. He knew he wasn't going to get a fair trial. Uh, one bishop that was in the session said, well, why don't we postpone it for a day or two? That was ignored. The council even received some Alexandrians, whom the, the government went and they searched for some Alexandrians who presented complaints and accusations against Pope Dioscorus. And uh, when you read the actual complaints, you can see it's very stark similarities between them and, and you can clearly see that someone, a, a common person was behind uh, those accusations and what they wrote. Uh, when Pope Dioscorus didn't appear uh, because he wasn't told that uh, they, they ignored his request for the government to attend and the other bishops from Ephesus too, uh, he did not appear and they proceeded to condemn him verbally and in writing and they wrote letters to him and to the emperor uh, and even to the clergy in Constant uh, of Alexandria in Constantinople and they even wrote a public notice on him. In the next session the bishops ratified the tomb of Leo unfortunately, as the benchmark of orthodoxy, not the writings of St. Cyril. And here we go back to the verse that we talked about in the very beginning. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Even though everyone, all of those bishops, they revered St. Cyril, but they had an agenda. They had an agenda to elevate Pope Leo as the benchmark for orthodoxy. And unfortunately, this uh, makes it very unfortunate that sometimes we let our ego get in the way of following the true way, and instead we stumble others. Uh, they accepted the Patriarch of Jerusalem and the others uh, who were suspended uh, back, and they signed the Tome of Leo, which in just a span of two years changed their minds of how they did not accept two natures two years prior uh, in uh, Ephesus 2 of 449 AD, and in just two years later in the Council of Chalcedon 451, they, they signed their name to it. In this session, the Egyptian bishops who were there, they submitted a faith statement to the emperor. It was read at the council. Uh, on the demand of the bishops, they anathematized Eutyches. The bishops were, were the other bishops, uh, aside from the Egyptians, were very harsh against them. Uh, they attacked them. Uh, the Egyptian bishops refused to sign the Tome of Leo. And the chairman, uh, even though the bishops demanded that they sign the tome, uh, the, the government did not force them until a new bishop of Alexandria was appointed. Of course, we, uh, we still maintain that Pope Dioscorus was the rightful bishop until he departed while in exile. And then finally, we'll talk about the, se the se session five, the new definition. They proposed a draft that said from two natures. The majority of the bishops were okay with it. 
except for, of course, those of Rome and some Syrians. And when they couldn't reach an agreement, the government said, okay, they sent a letter to the emperor, let's see what he says. The emperor said, you better come to a consensus or we're sending the council to Rome where Leo would preside, okay? Still, amazingly, the bishops put up resistance even to the, to the emperor's uh, order. Uh, but then the chairman said, look, Pope Dioscora said from, na from two natures, and Leo is the one who said two. So who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow Pope Dioscorus, who was just uh, banished and degraded? Or are you going to follow Leo? And so when he put it that way, all the bishops followed Leo. And they, they chose 17 bishops. They went to a side chapel. And they amended the draft. They made it into a strong two-nature language to be part of the definition. Uh, uh, this specific session had several omission in the meeting minutes, several omissions in the meeting minutes and edits in the meeting minutes to, to suppress the, uh, the impression that the Council of Bishops were, were not united. Uh, comments on the new definition uh, it shows the political reality, it shows the lack of Episcopal freedom, and it was a tragedy for the idea of Christian unity because up to today, uh, the Church has the two families, the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian Churches. The aftermath of Chalcedon, unfortunately, in the different cities were protests, riots in, in Alexandria, uh, very sad. Uh, they were suffering of uh, the faithful Christians. 30,000 were martyred by the Chalcedonian Patriarch whom the government installed, Proterius. And another 200,000 later on in the 6th century uh, by the Christians who refused to accept Chalcedon where it was uh, written that the blood reached the knees of the soldiers. And later on also far, 400 monks were martyred at Edessa because they refused to accept Chalcedon. We all know the story of Saint Samuel the Confessor who took the tome and he said anathema to the tome, anathema to Chalcedon, anathema to Leo and everyone who believes according to it and he tore the tome and threw it outside the church. He was flogged until he was near dead and even lost his right eye. Anathemas by Saint Severus, he said, no one shall be our fellow communicant. Anyone who receives the wicked synod at Chalcedon does not and does not anathematize the tomb of Leo and who does not say an open anathema against anyone who teaches and speaks of two natures after the, un after the Union. St. Cyril himself never spoke of two natures after the Union. And finally, Pope Theodosius said, In truth, I anathematize the Tome of Leo and the Council of Chalcedon. Whomever acknowledges them is anathema henceforth forever. Amen. In conclusion, I want to say that we should rest, be rest assured that our beloved Mother, the Coptic Orthodox Church, along with the rest of the Oriental Orthodox Churches, are the faithful upholders and the faithful followers of the upright faith, the Orthodox faith, and the pure doctrines of St. Cyril, the unadulterated doctrines of St. Cyril. And one last thing is that when we think about the Church and when we stand in the liturgy and we pray for the peace of the Church, we should pray that the schisms of the Church cease, as we say in the Gregorian liturgy, but not at the expense of the precious blood of the martyrs who suffered for the true faith and for not accepting 
the Council of Chalcedon and those wonderful confessors, and also not at the expense of compromising the true and upright faith. May the Lord grant us to be faithful and to live always in His faith, in His pure faith, and not to be stumbled. To Him is the glory, now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.